Most people live in a world that is so restricted with laws and patterns and traditions and precedents and policies that it is a natural instinct for man to seek some escape from the domination of outside circumstances. He has found in the material world that when he tries to go against prevailing policies of his time, he places himself under heavy penalties. And after a while, he accepts the domination of events. But this does not mean that in his heart and soul he has not preserved the desire for freedom. We all have a sort of feeling that there's a wonderful world somewhere or a wonderful time ahead when we can do as we please, where circumstances will not curtail us and we will not be forced eternally to conform. The psychological phase of this problem points out that a great many individuals finding their external lives greatly restricted attempt to escape into an internal existence which they instinctively assume to be lawless. Most persons entering into their own internal psychology feel that in this area they should be able to do as they please. They can have a private life inside themselves, which is certainly beyond the jurisdiction of material law and order. But it does not follow that the internal life of man is not under certain specific rules. It is hard for us, therefore, ever to escape a lawful state of affairs. There is one difference, of course, between the laws of the external world and those of the inner life. In the external world, laws are arbitrarily made Many of them are essentially good. Some of them are superabundant, too confused and involved to hold our real respect or admiration. And in some way, these laws do not seem to adjust to the real needs of individuals. Laws are made for groups, and the person must always be the victim of the collective circumstances of his time. We therefore like to assume that the inner life of man is not under such arbitrary statutes. And it is true that the laws are different, but they are nevertheless constantly operating. The laws of the inner life are based upon natural law itself. These laws have never been amended or passed upon by physical legislators. They have never been subject to debate. There have never been any filibustering in this area. These laws are man's most immediate acquaintance with the great pattern of universal procedure. So man going inside of himself must trust himself to universal law just as man on the outside must adjust himself to man-made law. Going in, therefore, into this inner area of subjective existence, man learns gradually that his emotions, his thoughts, his ideas, and his opinions are all of them subject to a kind of supervision. And if he fails to guard his own character, nature begins to move in and impose various penalties upon him. In old religions, penalties were divided into two classifications. One consisted of crimes, 
meaning the breaking of physical uh, legislative laws and codes, and the others were called sins, which were crimes against the inner life, against God, the spirit, and the great metaphysical structure of principles in which the individual exists and has his being. And even in old times it was pointed out that to break a mortal law is bad. To break one of the immortal laws in space is worse. Because we set in motion circumstances and conditions which we must abide by over a long period of time. Philosophic nations, therefore, early recognized the operation of the principles of cause and effect in the psychological life of man. And the Hindus created their doctrine of karma to take care of this phase of human responsibility. Karma was simply the law of cause and effect applied to the mental and emotional activity of the human being. Where planets follow planets in the sky, where great motions of universal energies occur, we think of cause and effect, where the individual comes into some pattern of penalties due to his own conduct. This is still cause and effect, but we call it karma, because we apply it more to the moral life, uh, to the activity of an intelligent creature. Naturally, the law of karma depends upon one factor namely that man has the power of personal decision. If man was not capable of a moral action, if he was not capable of choosing a course of conduct by a free choice of his own conscience and his own consciousness, there could be no karma. Yet his body, nature, and all the parts of him would still be under the grand pattern of cause and effect. In philosophy, the thought has long been advanced uh, that it would be very good for the average person to recognize the lawfulness of the processes taking part or taking place within him. In other words, if we could really come to believe that our thoughts and emotions were under a legislative control, that we were responsible for them, and that if we violate their laws, we must pay the penalty, just as surely as we must pay a fine or lose privileges if we break physical law. To recognize that this strange, scattered, confused pattern of our feelings could be under a pattern of law is a little difficult for the average person. He senses very little organization in his own inner life. He would like to have it. He knows it is possible. He believes it would be good, but he still doesn't exercise the processes which would bring it about. Consequently, as we get up in the morning, and we have all kinds of thoughts, as we go along through the day with the innumerable conflict of ideas and attitudes and opinions, and we find ourselves liking this and hating that, wishing we were somewhere else, not keeping our minds properly focused upon the things we are doing, as we drift along through the day with these rather slipshod policies, it hardly occurs to us that we're getting into trouble. Or perhaps we rather say that by the very endowments that we have, we're always in trouble, and this is just another example. Perhaps it might be, however, very good, philosophically speaking, to settle down to the simple conclusion that thoughts are things, and that thoughts and things are governed by law, that emotions must follow and obey the principles upon which they depend, and that all things must in some way be true and faithful to the source of their own nutrition, to the very vital energies that make them possible. Man then can settle down to include in his psychology of life 
a very simple and clear definition of the relationship between law and his own feelings, his own moods, his own attitudes. If he can do this, uh, many things that are now complicated will straighten out. The law of cause and effect operating in nature operates in cor correlation with several other laws, each of which has its own part to play in the complete pattern. But for our purposes, perhaps, this law can be separated from the others, at least for the purpose of an evening's discussion. And uh, we can bring some emphasis to bear upon an area which is of peculiar vitality at the moment. In order to get a good philosophy of life, we must do a little philosophizing about living. Without this uh, procedure, we will not obtain a clear insight into the purpose for our own existence. So we can say first that the law of cause and effect operating from the most remote conceivable time and in every area, level, field of existence tells us one primary truth at the beginning, namely that everything has a purpose that what is actually happening throughout the universe is that purpose is revealing itself. A purpose that has to exist. A purpose that has a pre-existence over all of the consequences and effects which emanate from it. Thus, law of cause and effect affirms a lawful universe uh, in all its parts, progressing according to an immutable, unchanging plan and that this, that this plan affects everything from the grain of sand to the cosmos itself. There is nothing immune to law. There is nothing greater than law. There is nothing that dares to break law. Because if this law is broken, the penalty is inevitable. Now, why is this penalty inevitable? Uh, early theologians attempted to theologize this concept. They felt that this penalty was punishment, that somewhere in the sky was an old man with a book, and in this book he wrote down everything that you did. And when finally came the judgment day, it was all read back to you, and for some people it will be pretty lurid reading. <laughs> this, however, was a rather childish approach to it. We do not believe that the finger of deity is going to point to some individual and say, you were pretty nasty on the 6th of June. We don't believe that type of retributional process. Nor do we believe that in the universe there are judges sitting somewhere that will give out penalties of various kinds, as it is done here, sometimes justly, sometimes not justly but according to the immediate situation or the whim of the moment. This does not seem to be right to us. Therefore, the law of cause and effect operating in our lives, we assume to be a sort of self-sustaining instrument. The individual who moves with the law moves in harmony with nature. The individual who moves contrary to law breaks his own harmonic rela relationship with life. The moment he uh, breaks harmony, he breaks faith. The moment he no longer moves with the great motion of space, he is no longer carried along by that motion. When he resists it, he receives the full impact of it against himself. So that the person who breaks laws simply breaks pattern, deprives himself of the great motions which would carry him painlessly to a good destiny. Instead of obeying these principles, moving with them, he tries to move contrary to them. He violates them in some way. This violation does not cause an entry in a ledger in the sky. This violation simply causes a resistance in the patterns around him. He finds himself not supported 
by the universe if he breaks its rules. And if he loses this support, he loses every orientation that he possesses. Now, the average person does not break faith utterly with universal patterns because he doesn't even know how to do this. He simply makes small mistakes. These small mistakes would naturally have small penalties, and they do. These penalties are very often nothing more serious than the minor accidents of small children who are foolhardy or who lack the patience or the industry to accomplish something well. One of the ways in which man has to learn is by means of coming into occasional conflicts with natural law. He has to gradually experience his way into a constructive association with nature. Animals and all of these lesser creatures, although largely dominated by instinct, also proceed by trial and error. Trial and error is a way of life which must be lived by persons who are not aware of the full rules of the game. They must attempt to do certain things, various things, and they must come into rewards which indicate they were right, or they must come into penalties which indicate they were wrong. This process is constantly going on, and within a reasonable area of normalcy, this pattern is expected by nature is accepted, and is nature's own way of instruction. But man, unfortunately, is not always sensitive uh, to the lessons with which nature provides him. We find individuals making the same mistakes through a long lifetime. We find that some folks just don't learn from what happens to them. These, of course, when they become on the level of human beings, not only have the advantage of the operation of law in their own lives, but they can study the operation of this law in history, in the development of arts and sciences. For in every art and science, we are in the presence of immutable laws, principles that must be obeyed if we wish to attain a certain end. If the musician does not obey the rules of harmony, he will not create great music. If the mathematician does not fulfill the laws of his science, his formulas are unsound, and arithmetic loses its meaning as an instrument in advancing life. If the chemist does not progress his experiments in a lawful manner, they will not work properly. And if he is too unlawful in his experimenting, he may blow himself in his laboratory uh, to small fragments. He may destroy himself. Thus, everywhere, the intelligent person tries to proceed with law. But he gets tired of this lawful procedure. He gets wearied with it, and he seldom brings it home and tries to apply it to the problems of his own inner life. He does not recognize the meaning of trial and error. One of the reasons why he gets into trouble, probably, is because he tries to play God in relationship to the laws under which he lives. Man has a peculiar little superstition of his own that nature has never supported, but which man himself industriously attempts to maintain. And that is that he, in some way, has a right to vary law according to his own pleasures, his own advantages. He feels that in a mysterious manner, he can break the law. Or perhaps he feels that in some way, law doesn't apply to him at all. This is true of the egotist. And one of the reasons why the egotist is always in trouble is that he is always elevating himself above the patterns which he should learn to obey. The willful person seems to feel that he can break his way through law, that laws are made for weak people, that he does not have to keep them, that he can live as he pleases, and that the universe will not too strenuously object. Thus, the willful person 
is to a sense, or in a sense, a kind of gangster who attempts to live according to his own code, and a very antisocial one at that. There are many persons also in this world who simply do not believe in a lawful universe. And this problem has affected us a great deal in more recent years. As our education, uh, particularly, lost its ethics, lost its recognition of moral value, it began to preach the idea uh, that man can do anything he wants to do. That the universe is a great blank area in which man can build his own conceits. If man wants a super industrial existence, he can have it. Because there's nothing in there, in nature, except what man puts in. There are no rules that must say that a man should be good or a man should be bad. These things are in his own decision. He can live as he pleases, think as he pleases, because there is no controlling power. This, of course, is quite possible if a person is an atheist or if he is an individual who has addicted himself to certain types of humanistic doctrines which simply take it for granted that the universe is here for man to exploit. And the man who exploits it the most becomes the richest, most powerful, popular man and may even attain the noble end of being the richest man in the graveyard. This end is always uh, considered, but people pay little attention to it. They keep on living until they can't live any longer. And they make very little effort to make their lives meaningful or intelligent. So if a person doesn't believe in a universe of natural law, obviously he does not feel impelled uh, to keep any rules that he does not have to keep. He doesn't really believe in laws in the community. He doesn't believe in speed laws. He doesn't believe in laws against crime. He has to endure them, but if he is psychologically an, a um, an atheist or an anarchist, he resents law and its operation in his life. And there are many people who just hate law. They don't believe in it. They think it's terribly unjust because it interferes with the right of anyone and everyone to do exactly as he pleases. Because of our modern viewpoint, this situation is getting into mental uh, institutions as a source of trouble. It is affecting the viewpoint not only of the patient, but of the physician. If the physician does not believe that he lives in a lawful universe, he cannot impress this upon his patient, nor can he use the principles of law to assist in therapy. He then becomes an individual doing anything he can think of to help somebody else who is in trouble. This is not what you might term a well-organized program, and it cannot produce the maximum results for all concerned. If we are rather more serious in this, however, uh, it would be very good if we could simply settle down sometime and sell ourselves a basic idea. And when I mean sell ourselves, I don't mean talk ourselves into a mental concept. I mean get so thoroughly imbued with an idea that it can never leave you again. And also that it can never let you alone if you go contrary to it. If we could finally reach a point where we could actually and honestly and honorably feel to the very core of ourselves that we do live under law, and that the only way we can be happy is to keep the law. We really believe this. We would not only change our inner lives tremendously, but probably very largely change the entire social problem of crime. Because crime is an expression of something. It does not arise spontaneously. It comes from a psychology of life that is bad, for one reason or another. The person who has the proper sense of responsibility and who has well-established ideals and principles does not normally become a criminal. He might, under great excess, be an occasional criminal. But crime as we know it would be reduced almost to the vanishing point if persons believed 
not merely in the power of physical law or material law, but in the inevitability of legal process in consciousness. That it's there inside governing us, directing us, and demanding certain things from us at all times. If we live with a sense of lawfulness inside of ourselves, then we could begin the serious program of self-integration. We would not require constant counseling. We would not require the unt untangling of the complicated threads of our psychic lives. We would know almost certainly how to conduct ourselves at all times. So let us assume for a moment uh, that we are interested in psychology as an instrument of self-improvement and therefore that we are interested in trying to put the psychic life into a little better regulated condition. Then let us begin uh, by things we have pointed out before, but they have, we almost have to mention them again to fit them into the picture. One of the first and most important conclusions that we can come to uh, in connection with this idea of a lawful way of life is that every thought and emotion, every instinct and impulse, must have an effect in us. That this effect must be exactly according to its cause. That it cannot be contrary. And that we cannot justify at any time an action that is contrary to the law of cause and effect. Furthermore, we can never, by argument or debate or interpretation, make a poor cause good any more than we can in any way detract from the dignity of a good cause. We often uh, try to assume that there are modifying circumstances by means of which we should be forgiven the common and ordinary mistakes that we should never make. Uh, you'll hear an individual say, I know I should have kept my temper under those circumstances, but I just didn't. But of course, uh, I, I had a tremendous amount of provocation, and therefore this provocation should seemingly justify this emotional intemperance. If the circumstances are bad enough, it is therefore right for us to do wrong. This is common thinking. If the temptation is great enough, it is the temptation that is to blame and not ourselves. If we have certain attitudes and these attitudes are not good, they're our own private business and people can either like it or not like it. That's up to them. We will continue on our present course. I've heard people say many times that they admitted that they had defects of character that were very real, but they'd always had them, and their parents had had them, and their friends have got them, so they're just going to keep them. And they don't see any reason why they should be blamed for having them especially by other people who aren't any better. This becomes a very definite feeling. I agree with these folks. They should not be blamed by other people who have the same mistakes. But they are going to be punished by nature that makes no mistakes. And there is nothing they can do about it. We perhaps should definitely follow the ancient idea that it is not up to us to judge anything. But nature itself judges righteous judgment. And before the court of nature, all of the facts are considered, and all the evasions are regarded just as they are in a court of physical law, where it is affirmed again and again that ignorance is no excuse in the face of the law. Now, ignorance may be an excuse to some degree in the face of natural law because we do not understand it. We try to, but we're not able always. 
But normally speaking, the individual is responsible when he performs an action or thinks a thought or feels an emotion which he himself knows is not right. Now, how is he going to know that it's not right? Well, one group falls back upon Kant's or great categorical imperative, which was a philosophical concept made to correct the mistakes in the golden rule. Uh, this categorical imperative simply states that when you want to know whether an action that you performed is right or not, you should simply say to yourself, if everyone else on earth did exactly the same thing, would we have a happy world? That's your final uh, imperative. In other words, when you measure your own conduct and perform any action, think any thought or feel any emotion, would you be glad if all your relatives did it to you at the same moment? Would you be happy if it became the law of the land? Would you rejoice if your business competitor did it? Would you be completely pleased about the whole thing if your children grew up and did it to you? If you can't say yes to this, then according to the imperative, you are wrong. You are wrong to do it yourself or permit yourself to do it. This is one way in which we can judge some of these matters. Now, aesthetics has another rule uh, to apply to this problem. How to judge whether what we do is right or not. Aesthetic says, is it beautiful? Is the thing we are doing truly noble? Has it about it a graciousness that would permit it to endure as a work of art? In other words, would we like to see a, ba a magnificent tapestry of how we felt on Tuesday morning? <laughs> or would we turn it to the wall and hope never to see it again? Uh, in our same concept, would we like to, uh, to have this particular thing we have done accepted as a true statement of ourselves? Would we want our friends and our neighbors and other people to judge us by this action alone? Uh, would we want our children to think of us in the terms of the attitude we took on this particular subject? Chances are we wouldn't want them to. We would want them to be patient with us, even as we are patient with them. And we will explain to them that when they grow up, they will have provocations just like what we had on Tuesday morning. And we can only hope they will do better than we have done, but we doubt it. Now, this type of thinking is entirely on our own. It has no relationship to values. It has no relationship to the principles upon which life is founded. Another level on which we can judge this particular attitude that we hold is, does it produce an immediate constructive effect? Here your law of cause and effect comes in. Now some people think that some of the things they do badly produce magnificent effects, just exactly the ones they want. They decide that they're going to insult someone. That person is properly insulted and walks away in a huff. And the person who did it is just tickled to death. <laughs> that is exactly what they wanted. They wanted to give this person a piece of their mind. So they gave them a piece of their notions instead, but they thought it was their mind. And uh, they are very smugly satisfied about the whole procedure. Some people just seemingly have to criticize or condemn something, or the day is a dismal failure. But does this, in turn, actually achieve any enrichment of life? What is it satisfying? It is satisfying that part of our natures 
which is largely responsible for the troubles we're in. Consequently, as we give power or authority to these negative instincts in ourselves, we gradually lose more and more control over our own thoughts and emotions and can well be on the way to psychotic trouble. Some psychologists take the position that uh, uh, the average person being somewhat neurotic anyway, there is nothing better for him than a good temper fit. If he gets good and mad at something, it sort of explodes. He's going to feel a lot better. I doubt this very much. I don't believe that a temper fit is a solution to anything. It is merely, perhaps, a letting off of a little steam. But it is letting it off in a violent way, like an earthquake, which lets off a little steam, or takes care of a shift in the Earth's surface, but which certainly cannot be regarded as especially helpful as an event. Uh, the um, person who has to let off steam in order to be happy simply doesn't know what to do with steam in the first place or he would know that it was created to drive an engine over some noble purpose besides an explosion. Uh, the person, therefore, who has to be uh, temperamentally uh, unbalanced in order to regain his composure is just wrong and in trouble already. The uh, problem, then, of letting these negative attitudes take over is one of condoning. Even in our physical way of life, we condone today many things that we should not accept. We condone them because others do, because it doesn't seem to be much we can do about them, and uh, they some ways seem to contribute to getting along, but we do not know just how. But this problem of condoning things that are wrong uh, does not work out in our inner lives any better than it does in our material affairs. Live by a, a code of compromise and you will ultimately come to grief. This is an experience that all persons have to go through at some time in their long evolutionary careers. The answer then is obviously one of trying to recognize the relationship between cause and effect in action. Some years ago, the rise of the psychosomatic theory clearly pointed out the relationship between human feelings and thoughts and health. And we came to some findings that were pretty important and pretty real as far as their value in our daily life is concerned. Perhaps some of the very ancient peoples were wiser than we have ever given them credit for being. In their contention that nearly all sickness was sent by the gods in punishment for error. We have this theory that uh, sickness, which we couldn't explain any other way, particularly in primitive society, when no one knew really what sickness was or how it came, the answer was that God sent it. That it came as a punishment for something. And for thousands of years we've been trying to figure out just what it was punishment for. And a lot of people felt it was very unfair and they resented the punishment tremendously. Perhaps under this thought of the psychology of it, this idea that sickness came from the gods or was a punishment for the breaking of the divine rules has a kind of truth in it. We don't believe in the old Olympian despots anymore, ruling the world from their cloud-swept palaces. But perhaps sickness in some way is a punishment sent by the law, an outworking of the universal principles governing human conduct. Psychosomatics certainly indicated a good structure of evidence in this direction. The fact also still does remain in society 
that happy people, cheerful people, kindly people, seemingly have better luck with health, if we may call it luck, than those of other temperaments. People whose dispositions are bad are usually unhealthy. They are usually crippled by ailments of one kind or another. And if these ailments are not of the body, they are of the mental and emotional structure itself. And persons who break the laws governing the use of thought and emotion are almost obviously penalized. We can almost see it happen in their daily affairs. We know that persons with attitudes which are unfriendly simply end up without friends. This is cause and effect. Now, these people have entirely different explanations for it. The less friendly others are, the more these individuals feel themselves to be the victims of injustice. So that in most instances, what we call injustice is just law and order coming back to us where we don't want it. We think that injustice is, that where, is when we are required to pay our bills. Justice is when other people pay their bills. It is perfectly just for other people to be good to us. But it isn't always just in our minds for us to be good to other people. Oh, these laws that do not work both ways have no place in a natural pattern. The Chinese pointed that out. Unless the law operates both ways, it is not fair or right and will not produce the constructive results that we want. Uh, the Buddhists numbered 106 faults from which man can suffer. I think they were very moderate in their listing, but the average person does not have any idea of 106 categories uh, working in his own nature against him. But practically every attitude that the average person holds is at least subject to improvement if he wants to improve it. But there are a whole chain of negative reactions, conscious and instinctive, which as long as they are tolerated or endured, will conspire against the well-being of the person. And as these policies that are not good are allowed to encroach upon the total psychic life of the person, he becomes less and less aware of them, until in the end, he is completely fooled by himself. He is deceived by his own attitude so completely that he has no conscientious desire to change or mend them. So let's try and see how this law of cause and effect works out in the moral pattern of human society as far as the inner conduct of man is concerned. Suppose we say uh, that there are a group of these negative attitudes. We mostly know them by name, and the names do not cause any great admiration. For instance, take jealousy. Jealousy is a very strange and mixed emotion. It rises in us very often without our control or direction. And again, a group of persons have made a virtue of it. Some people think they're neglected unless someone is jealous of them. I've heard a good many young families in which the wife has stated definitely that if her husband wasn't jealous of her, she'd leave him. There's a pleasant thought. In most cases, he obliged, I think. But then, after a while, if this kept up, he might have had to work pretty hard to oblige. But many people think, unless others are jealous of them or possessive of them, that they are indifferent. And this situation causes jealousy under certain conditions to be regarded as a serious offense. Under others, as something practically entitled to uh, receive the crown of martyrdom. It all depends upon the circumstances. But nature says no. Jealousy as an emotion is wrong. Jealousy is the perversion of an emotion. All perversion is wrong. 
just as surely as a man thinks. So he can worry. And worry is a misuse of mental energy. Now, there can be thousands of reasons why we worry. But if we worry, we break the law. Now, this is pretty stiff thinking, and it would make an awful lot of lawbreakers. But the fact remains that nature expects us to worry a little. Nature has supplied us with some very special materials in the form of endocrine secretions, which we can call upon in terms of worry. It also has provided us with natural secretions to call upon when we become afraid, which is another na uh, uh, negative emotion. Nature knows that we're going to fall under these pressures sometimes and to some degree. And there are probably a half a dozen times in the life of the average person where it would be very difficult, if not impossible, for an individual with our allotment of understanding not to worry. But these incidents do not constitute the chronic worrier. The chronic worrier has long ago used up all natural defense. He has exhausted all natural support that might come to him in time of emergency just as the coward has used up all of his fear resources. He is simply uh, a, an excessive example of a negative attitude. So the worrier who worries about everything is a lawbreaker. He is going into a negative relationship with himself, which breaks the, uh, the basic laws of mind. He is going into negative relationships with other people, he is uh, creating a minus quantity in his own psyche. He's creating negative habits with which he must later live. And if he worries long enough, he will have plenty to worry about. Nature will take care of providing him if he insists on developing that faculty. And he will ultimately come to grief because worry will produce a gradual disorientation of his psychic nature and degeneration of his physical resources. He is just not permitted to get away with it. And you can say this for every type of attitude you have. Now the same is true in what we call basic constitutional attitudes. Most persons are born with a disposition which other people wish they didn't have. But we don't seem to know much about what to do about it. We are born with prevailing tempers and tendencies. Some people become emotional easily. Others are quiet regardless of pressure or circumstances. Some hold grudges naturally. Others just do not. Uh, some become tremendously excited over small matters. Others do not rise to these occasions at all. <coughs> There are all kinds of basic temperaments, and these different temperaments are largely differentiated according to their dominant excesses. A temperament that is particularly um, tempestuous, we may call a caloric disposition, a fiery nature. And the ancients recognized four natures, fiery, earthy, airy, and watery, corresponding to the elements. And the earthy nature was the one that was always somber and a little bit on the sad side of things and gradually ran into very materialistic fears about its own survival. Uh, the watery nature was the one in which there was a great deal of vacillation of temperament. The currents of life were constantly moving and the individual lacked stability. The fiery temperament was was tempestuous and elemental, as the fire itself suggests. The airy disposition was the intellectual, rather whimsical nature, in which everything was touched with a certain breeze or lightness, but which under some conditions could turn into a terrible storm. So these temperaments were recognized. And as we are born with them, with them of these factors, we grow up with them from childhood. 
and accept them to be natural and normal and quite reasonable. In fact, they are no longer temperaments. They are ourselves. We are these things. And because we are these, we do not think of changing them or really desiring to particularly. We assume that they are proper because they are us. They are our own natures. But if any of these patterns are not good, they are still going to lead into trouble. And uh, as the psychological situation gets more extreme every day, we have to begin to work a little with some of these problems. And we're going to have to work with them in the near future and in the years that lie ahead. Because at the present time, great strain is being placed upon our integration by world affairs. The average person today is being tested more than he realizes by the circumstances around him. He has many opportunities for fear, he has many opportunities for worry, and he has quite a few opportunities for hatred. Uh, we are finding it very easy uh, to escape from the small degree of control that we had over ourselves in comparatively placid times. So we are being tried, we are being weighed in the balance, and a lot of people are being found wanting. In fact, most people are found wanting something, if the truth were known. But actually we are found without an adequate amount of internal resource. We've, we are found becoming panic-stricken, uh, worrying about things excessively. And in this worrying state, we almost feel a little patriotic. If we really can get ourselves into a stew about something, we are taking a serious interest in life. If we come up with conclusions that are no good, but indicate a tremendous amount of intensity, we are supposed to be thoughtful people. But these, this strain that is coming to us, is going to uh, reflect in our psychology of life over many years that lie ahead. And either man must meet strain with internal integration and growth, or he will break under that strain. And society as a collective will fall back into savagery, simply because it is unable to stand the pressure of conditions upon an immature internal life. Nature sometimes has to play it that way. Nature has its end, and that end is one and one end only, namely that man shall fulfill the purpose for which he was created. And as far as we can tell, we don't know the ultimates of these things, but as far as we can tell, the purpose of man is to unfold the tremendous power within himself and become truly aware as a conscious being of the reason for his own existence, the purposes for which he was fashioned, the laws governing him, and the nature of the great universe of consciousness uh, with which he shares through the conscious parts of his own faculties. In other words, man is to grow, grow infinitely and indefinitely towards a magnificent achievement, which is a complete integration of his entire consciousness. Perhaps if he achieves this end, he shall truly be like the gods, knowing good and evil. But in any event, nature is trying to perfect him, to make him every day better, wiser, nobler, stronger in real values. And nature keeps on pressing this point relentlessly. And nature punishes every individual or every process which would hamper, restrict, limit, or delay this achievement. And is constantly observant of these processes. Allowing man his trial and error procedure, nature still demands that he learns something. That this trial and error shall not be a continuous cycle of accidents, all meaningless but that gradually the individual will learn what he shall do and what he shall not do. And the wise man, having learned these things, does what he should do. Nature's plan is just that simple. 
Yet its very simplicity baffles us and outrages us because of the innumerable personal attitudes we are capable of holding and which we feel that we have a perfect right to exercise at any time. In the study of man's integration, we know that man can be subject to two evils, and that these two evils, as Pythagoras pointed out 2,600 years ago, are the evils of excess. Now, excess is either superabundance or deprivation. Excess is imbalance, always. That which is too much is unbalanced. That which is too little is unbalanced. A man who has uh, too much uh, is a plutocrat, and his problems are according to his possession. The man who has too little is unable to provide his natural needs or to live in proper dignity with other human beings. So these excesses represent causes, continuous causes of trouble. Now in man, excess is nearly always present. He measures his emotions in terms of their excesses. When he is happy, he is very optimistic. When he is unhappy, he is very miserable. And he alternates between these polarities continuously. When he is virtuous, he is just overloaded with it until it becomes almost intolerable. When he lacks it, he becomes a scoundrel that no one can admire. He has lost the golden mean, the concept of moderation. Wherever there is an excess in our nature, it will lead us into excessive action. And nature does not function by excess. Excess itself is wrong, because nature realizes that excess always leads to a tangent, that an excessive situation always forces the possessor of it into a conflict with life, and this conflict of life means that he will ultimately be tossed back into the stream of life, wounded and bruised by the experience. Therefore, the person who has any excess in his nature must first begin to achieve moderation. What he cannot control completely, what he cannot prevent entirely, what he cannot dominate wholly, he brings into line through moderation. If he must worry, he will worry moderately. If he must be jealous, he will be very moderate at it. If he is to be selfish, he will be very moderate in his selfishness. He will gradually work away from excess toward the Socratic mean. He will find gradually that as he moderates these pressures, their insistences diminish also. And after a period of moderation, further moderation is easy. But from a stage of excess to one of complete control, is a terribly difficult and almost dangerous step. So wherever there is uh, trouble in our nature, our first problem is to reduce the trouble, uh, to make it less continuously, by exercising gradually greater wisdom and understanding over the situation uh, that may arise. One of the old pra uh, habits, of course, practices was that in these pressureful moments, pause and consider. Our forefathers advised everyone to count ten. Well, sometimes today you haven't got quite time for ten, but you can count five and see if it won't help. The universe was opening at the seams as far as they were concerned. But the next day wasn't even worth the trip over here. And this is life. If we can just get ourselves past this first flare-up of tremendous intensities, <clears throat> we will frequently take over the situation ourselves and handle it. But if in that flare-up we do something or say something that has permanently detrimental effects, then we may be half a lifetime getting over it. We may be angry with the, the man with whom we have been dealing in business. And we may wish him all kinds of trouble. But if we pause 
and go off and reflect about it a little bit, we may work it out. But if in the heat of our difficulty, in that moment of supreme anger, we pick up a rock and break his store window, then we're in trouble. We just didn't pause. And that was, would have been the pause that would have refreshed us, but we didn't use it. So we got into trouble. And in the, in the moments of emergency, it isn't always the thing itself, the emergency that gets us into trouble. It is what we do about it in the heat, heat of an emotional pressure. It is not the magnitude of the original event. It's what we have done to bruise, injure, and enlarge that event that perhaps becomes the big problem we later have to handle. So wise persons have begun to recognize the importance in psychology of gradually gaining a certain calmness a certain ability to meet even serious situations with some personal integration. I knew a person who did pretty well at that. Tragedy struck their family, and a very near and loved one passed on. This person stood up through the funeral beautifully. So beautifully that the relatives thought that they didn't care for the deceased and had absolutely no human sympathy. Everyone else was weeping copi copiously. And self-control was regarded in this case as a fault by people who'd never had it. Actually, the person who didn't do the weeping was the one who paid all the bills for the sick person. <laughs> the others did the weeping, but nothing else. <laughs> this situation recurs continuously. And we do sometimes have to stand a certain amount of criticism if we integrate. People expect other people to fall apart. If they don't, it's an insult. We resent the composure of those persons who are able to handle situations better than we are. But this is one kind of resentment we will have to get over. It is not any good for the other person to compromise his own principles and try to please everyone. One way that the ancients had of approaching this problem was to quietly sit down by a retrospectional exercise and through a process of meditation or contemplation to put the laws of nature into the incidents of life. If at the end of a day we can take five minutes to try to find out what the day meant, or if we can occasionally tear ourselves away from the television long enough uh, to sit down and say, what did I learn from this thing that I've just gone through? What did it really mean? And try to get underneath this grand blanket explanation that you may have arrived at, namely that you were simply uh, being made to suffer unjustly, and try to find out what it all added up to. Why did the things happen? How did you fail? How did you contribute to an unhappy situation that you have just passed through? And how are you going to make something good out of the consequences? There is no book in the world in which we can learn more than the book of our own lives. We all have mysteries of things that have happened. Good luck, bad luck strange and involved circumstances. We've never really straightened them out. They've never become the source of new courage or strength to us. If we would sit down and think them through, perhaps they would. We could gradually learn what these things have meant and how they prove the operation of universal law. If we, if we look back over a long lifetime of unadjusted activity, we can at least get a picture of what unadjustment does to us. We cannot look back over a poorly lived life and then contemplate the result as favorable. It cannot be. There may be some things we did fairly well, and for these we have had some rewards, and this is also important, because it points out although that although the law is a general law. 
Its operation is as specific as every incident in our own lives. We may have been unpleasant to everyone we know. This is in the law, and it sits there as a record. But we were good to a cat, and that is also in the law. There is a record of it. We were on the wrong side of every question, perhaps, except one. But that one, on which we were on the right side, has also produced its own unique result. Consequently, we are not simply hit over the head with a club uh, in a collective punishment for everything that we do. The life of the individual is a mixture of things done in varying degrees of rightness and wrongness. The consequences are therefore also a mixture. The reason that every day we live is a mass of confusion is because it does represent the total of the confusion which created it. So if today isn't quite the kind of a day you most enjoy, then it is due to the mixture of the various factors of psychological activity which have come down in their varying degrees of development to now. And here they are as the sum total of their own past, presenting themselves as strength or weakness in our immediate activity. If we will study a little while these various factors in ourselves, we can see the operation of the law. And if we go through a long experience study of this nature and come out without the discovery of law, we have just been kidding ourselves. Now, one thing that's hard for most people is to be that honest. They don't mean to be dishonest, but it's just very difficult for the average person to intelligently estimate his own mistakes. He will either deny them utterly and insist that the world was against him, or else he will take on the attitude of a penitent, consider that he is a worm, worse than nothing, and that he is, doesn't deserve anything better than cosmic flagellation till the end of time. Again, a creature of excesses. He simply cannot sit down and weigh and estimate himself as he might a stranger or another person. He cannot say, in this I was just about right, and in that one I was certainly wrong. He can't do this quietly. Every time he was right, he kind of gets egotistic over the thought of it. And every time he was wrong, he either tries to talk himself out of it or goes into a deep despond over the whole thing. He simply cannot think these things through straight. He has to mix them, confuse them, emotionalize them. And as a result, justice evaporates. The facts are not observable or notable to him. So it's a hard problem, it takes a little discipline to get this thing started right. But it can be done, and it uh, will pay off very heavily in um, improvement of life and conduct. Let's put it in another way, because this might help to clarify things. If you think that you've had a run of bad luck, that just problems seem to be getting bigger and bigger, that things just seem to be going less and less as they should, uh, this sort of suggests a little self-examination. Are you developing some unusual psychophysical symptoms? Are you subject to, to uh, strange ailments that defy scientific analysis? One of the most common things we hear from people who come for help is, I've been to the best doctors who say there isn't a thing of matter with me and I'm absolutely miserable. There's no physical thing that could be found. Now, this doesn't mean there wasn't anything physical, because uh, even the best physicians don't always find them, and no two of them will agree entirely on what they do find. But there are many instances in which the person is physically in good health, as far as any scientific knowledge will permit us to know. Yet this person is a wreck. They're falling apart. They're too tired to put one foot in front of the other. They are suffering from all kinds of symptoms. 
They are under the pressure of everything from migraines to arthritis. And yet there's nothing wrong with them. They are just miserable. Or as they used to say in the old days, before they had scientific names for everything, they were just ailing. This type of situation certainly suggests a psychological pressure of some nature. And it's nearly always there if you start looking for it. Uh, the individual whose psychological life is bad is uncomfortable. His probabilities of success in anything are greatly diminished. His probabilities of being able to live a fairly optimistic personal life are very few and very poor. He is just allowing his temperament to completely wreck him and opening him through this constant debilitation to all kinds of physical ailments that may ultimately set in and destroy him. He just is not fair to his own life, and yet you can't tell him. He is set in his peculiar viewpoints. But sometimes when you can't tell a person, you may be able to interest them in discovering for themselves. Anything you give to another person is advice, and most folks resent it. But if we can give the person some instruments by means of which he can analyze himself and come to discover in himself the reason for his own condition, when he sees it in himself, he can't do very much except accept it. He can no longer deny it. You can diagnose him correctly and he will hate you. But if he can diagnose himself, he has to acknowledge what he finds. Because it is part of his own temperament to believe himself to be right. And if he analyzes his own nature and comes up to some positive results, he has to accept these results as indication that he has the power to think, that he is capable of being a reasonable creature. So if we can get everyone to take this attitude generally, that life is divided into two ways of doing things, and two kinds of things you can do. One is right and the other is wrong. There is no middle ground in this. But the right is in the middle, for the right is always equilibrium, and the wrong is at both extremities both excessive attitudes of uh, exaltation or depression, of too much egotism and too little. The excesses are always the worst. But the right thing itself is that which advances the compound purpose of the individual and does so in a manner that is harmonious with law and therefore brings no retribution to the person. When we perform the action correctly, we get a reward. When we perform it incorrectly, we get a retribution. We've all had enough retributions. We don't need any more unless we have to have them. But we have not had as many rewards as we would like, and we wish we could have more of them. And the way to have more of them is to cause them in effect and cause operating in nature, everything we want has to be caused by an attitude, a condition, or an action, or a thought, or emotion suitable to produce that thing. Causes have a certain similarity with their effects. They also are consistent in being related to the inevitable consequence which follows them. If we wish to have a peaceful life, we must cause it. And how do we cause a peaceful life? By performing all actions necessary to ensure the peace of life. We must set up the pattern. If we should inherit from some ancestor 40 acres of good farmland, we might sit back and say to ourselves, now we will have a fine crop of hay. But if we do nothing with the land, it will not long produce anything. 
It is the industry with which we work the 40 acres that determines whether or not there'll be any hay. It is exactly the same with man. The biotribal parables are very wise in these things. What we sow, we reap. If we sow the whirlwind, we reap the whirlwind. If we sow corn, we will have corn. If we sow wheat, we will have wheat. If we sow nothing, we will have weeds. There is just no escaping these principles. So whatever kind of life we want, assuming that it is a proper and right life in itself, that life we must cause. For this life of intended purpose will not cause itself. We cannot simply wait with the full assurance that in time these good things will come. For between us and this time that we think of will be a large interval of other things that are not good. If then there is any condition in life which is not agreeable, we must cause its correction or removal. If there is some good goal that we know is right, which is apparently remote, we must bring it nearer by causing it. And in each problem we must bring the cause to its proper fruition. And having set a cause in motion, whatever it is, we must accept without grief or grievance the result of that cause we have set in motion. Man has the right to create a cause pattern. But once it is caused, he loses control of it. It becomes inevitable that it will produce some effect. Now, he may go to work on this cause soon after he starts it and attempt to modify it. And if he works hard enough, he can modify it. But he must cause the modification. If he does this, he will cause the modification of the effect. But everything has to operate according to a pattern of planned purpose. If then our life is not what we want, we have to decide what we want and cause it. If we are wise people, we will want that which is good. If we are unwise people, we will merely want some gratification of something that has been denied us. If we choose the wrong goal, we will be penalized by getting what we chose and then finding we cannot endure it. And this has happened many, many times. Therefore, nature will teach us in this way. If our goal is unworthy of us and we attain it, it is not worth its cost. But if it is right and proper, then we can build by gradual intensification of our own determination. Now, the proper goal that people who are really thoughtful and wise should be working for is this goal of internal integration, the bringing of the nature together in peace. This is the most important thing there is, that man should be able to live with himself, that he should find in his internal life a strength a dignity and beauty that are greater than any stress from the outside and that through the gradual development of this inner dignity, he will also gradually gain access to the universal principles which we call life and God and truth. Thus, the purpose of the person is to grow into a true human being. A true human being is a humane being, a being in whose nature the graces of life have found their maturity. That this person is the ideal character with which literature and art and religion and philosophy uh, have been decorated. He is, or they, this character is the symbol of the truly good person, good in all respects and parts and enjoying the courage and the wisdom, the understanding, and the gentleness of true greatness. This is the being that we would like to be. 
and we have to begin to cause it. And we cause it by doing the things that produce it. If we want to be wise, which is one of the most necessary elements, then we must cause wisdom in ourselves. If we want to be kind, we must earn the kindness in ourselves. Whatever we wish to bring to bear upon this archetypal being, the creation of which is the creation of the transcendent one in Chinese philosophy, we have to bestow upon ourselves these virtues by acquiring them and then building them into consciousness. If we are inept in everything and cannot make a decent living, then we go to a business advisor. He tells us to learn to do something well, may give us an aptitude test to find out what we can do best, and then suggest we go back to school or go to night school and a trade school or by correspondence or by some means get the training that we need. This is in order that we may be adjusted economically here. In order to be adjusted psychologically inside of ourselves, we must then find our needs and settle ourselves to gaining those attributes and powers without which we cannot function adequately. We have apparently certain endowments. <coughs> we call them gifts. These gifts are the conscious attainment we bring forward from the past. Upon these gifts we must build. These constructive endowments we must expand and develop. But we have also brought with us a load of unfinished business. And this also has to be faced. Now what are we going to do then with the emergencies that arise in spite of the fact that apparently we have not immediately caused them, that these emergencies are remote things? Buddha would have called them, of course, the gradual gathering up of the loose ends of karma. And in this uh, gathering of loose ends, we are continually confronted with circumstances that appear to be irritating, appear to be difficult, and perhaps even tragic. Nature is, however, not testing us in the ordinary sense of the word. It is simply uh, bringing to focus causations which are real but remote, because causes and effects move in cycles of various sizes. Some causes and effects have their results in terms of minutes. A certain cause will have its effect in two hours, four hours. That thing we ate for dinner will have its effect within three or four hours. Poison will have its effect in two or three minutes. Whatever the cycle of this law may be, the effect will follow the cause inevitably. But some of the effect cycles are much larger than the average life of the person. Therefore, he brings forward a great many larger cyclic life problems, which often result uh, from large cyclic patterns of mistakes, such as too many people are building right now, where a whole generation goes, for example, to the excess that this generation has gone to in worldly comforts and, and conveniences, and has a, a stay, attained these at such a complete sacrifice of moral and ethical principles. This means a generation that must face a future, and that a cycle must necessarily arise in which this attitude will be corrected, because no one will ever be allowed to get away with it. But it may not happen in this lifetime. But there are things we bring with us that did not happen in this lifetime. So we not only have the problem of creating new situations that are right, but as Pythagoras pointed out, we have the eternal problem of facing the situations that already exist or that come to face us. If we face these problems as we previously did, we will set a new cycle of causation in action. Buddha tells us this. If when the emergency arises, we become as rattled as we have always been, as unfair as we previously were, and as selfish as we may have intended to be, we will simply project this same problem again into the future, because we have brought into effect upon it a series of destructive methods which become causes of further trouble. 
If we meet an effect badly, then, this very circumstance causes a new effect, which we will have to meet again. It is therefore not only wise for us to try to do new things well, but also to try to clear up old business well. To clear up old business in a constructive manner is quite a trick. But it is quite possible to the person who has already begun to think. He may say to himself, here I am at 40, getting along pretty well, everything seemed to be going very well, and all of a sudden my business fails, apparently through no fault of my own. And this man may have a sufficiently good business background to be pretty fair in his estimations. He may be quite honest on this subject that he cannot see how he could have prevented this failure. Now, he has a problem on his hands now. How is he going to react to this problem? Is he simply going to take it out on his competitors? Is he simply going to accept the fact that they ruined him? This he would not want them to do to him, because he would insist that if they have a good product, as he had a good product, they have a right to succeed and that their success should not spell his failure, especially if he lived with them for a number of years and they didn't spell failure. He may have all kinds of other attitudes to explain this problem, but actually he is faced with a crisis. This crisis is either going to force him to make more mistakes or it is going to force him uh, to think straight and come through this thing. He may under certain pressure, simply go into a complete nervous breakdown. Many individuals who have passed through a serious business crisis have ended the mental hospital. They are simply unable to adjust to it. Whether it is the loss of the business or the loss of their ego is a very hard thing to tell sometimes. Perhaps in reality, it is this sudden sense of failure uh, which a person finds it great difficulty in adjusting to. He, he cannot uh, uh, be humiliated without some kind of a terrible hurt inside of himself. He has been a leader. Now he is no longer a leader. He has been respected for his knowledge. Now he is no longer respected. These things destroy him. He becomes unable to do anything else with the situation. Even if he comes out of this problem, he's a broken man. And he will drift along in whatever way he can, half-heartedly perhaps trying to rebuild, and perhaps to a measure getting back on his feet to the degree that the immediate wounds are not opened, but actually still a pretty badly damaged person. This situation happens frequently. There are other people who faced with the same situation. A man came into me once who had had this same thing happen under a very trying and critical situation. His own children had stolen this business. Now, that's a pretty hard thing to be faced with. And I know a great many persons who would have either committed suicide or murder under that provocation, or at least had a very dignified ulcer. <laughs> but this chap didn't. He simply, for some reason, that it was sometimes hard to explain. He simply took it in stride. Well, he says, I got rid of that business. Now he says, I, I don't have to do that anymore. Now I'm going to do some of the things I want to do. So he started a new business, an entirely different field. He said, I was tired of that one anyway. And he has succeeded because he didn't pay any attention to the idea of failure. It didn't worry him. He didn't even hate his children. If he had hated his children, he would have never started another business. He would have been defeated by that alone. But he has some beliefs that are rather good, basically. He said, you know, I don't hate them. I'm not even angry with them. Well, I was a little hurt at first. But he said, the thing that now concerns me most of all is that I'm desperately sorry for them. I know in my heart that they have set something in motion that must ultimately hurt them. He said, I'd do anything I could to try to explain that and help them to see that. But he said, I can't do it now. He said, I'm worried over what they've done to themselves, not what they've done to me. Because I can get along. He said, I don't have to live with this. They do. 
So he started out and succeeded again. It was just a difference in attitude. Now these differences of attitudes indicate clearly that we can have these different attitudes. And we can often have them in one person, a whole variety of them. And when a problem comes up that has to be faced, and it is a difficult problem, the question is to regard it in some instances as a release, in some as a solution, and in, in some as a tremendous incentive uh, to make great discovery, uh, to advance some part of our own natures by a dramatic achievement of self-directive. If we do this, we do not get the negative results. We do not penalize ourselves and tear down our worlds. One of the hardest things, perhaps, is to live with people who are continually negative and who therefore work a continuing hardship upon a person who tries to retain his own optimism. But here again we face the same problem, exactly. Uh, the negative person uh, should not really be blamed because they are doing something to themselves that we could pray they do not do. We must give them every possible incentive to get over it, just as we would not like to see any creature destroy itself. If we saw a man raise a gun to his head, we'd try to take it away from him, instinctively. If he jumps in the river, we'll try to jump in and save him, even though perhaps we drown with him. These are human instincts. We do not like to see people hurt themselves. And even if we're angry with them for a moment, this passes. And in the wiser person, there's always this tremendous sense of the danger that another person places himself in when he lives less than himself. But this danger can also occur to our own natures if we live less than our own understanding. So in all these problems, if we can face them, uh, not with the antagonisms and the uh, resistances with which people so often re react, but simply face change as perhaps the most important thing in the world. I know a case uh, uh, that has come to my attention recently of a very close mother-daughter relationship. The mother was exceedingly long-lived, and finally, before she did pass, the daughter herself was in her 70s. It was one of those very close ties. The daughter had never had any life of her own at all. She'd never married. She'd never had a romantic affair. She'd never had a profession. All she had done was take care of her mother. Now, you can imagine what this meant when the mother finally passed on. The daughter found herself almost at the end of her own life with very little possibility of ever living a life of her own. Here was a great problem. Here was a case where a bad situation became tragic in a loss, because in that loss, everything was gone. But the situation itself was bad from the very beginning, and there's probably no law in nature more wise than that which finally does uh, apply the principle of the death rate to break up situations that might never otherwise be corrected. And here's this person now facing life, facing it very unfit for life, and yet basically a wonderful person, as a self-sacrificing individual like that must be. It's very idealistic, but not integrated. No clear vision of how to stand on her own feet. Obviously, under the situation, uh, she wouldn't have had much opportunity. But here is a decision. Here is something that to, can be to her a tragedy that will end in her own death in a few years, or it can be the liberation of her life into at least a few years of self-expression in which she will have the right to begin to exercise her own individuality, which nature wants her to do. And so she has to move on into a personal existence with new motives, and not depend upon the smothering motive of her own affection uh, for the full expression of her life. These conditions arise. To her, for the moment, this passing of her mother is the greatest tragedy that could have possibly happened, although she knew in herself that it probably would have to happen. The chances are that she would survive her mother. But it, when it did come, it was a terrible disaster because there was no equipment for it. 
that this decision has to be made to build a life, to go on, to create, to be an individual at last, and to recognize that under this tragedy was the first liberation she had ever known, but she did not want to be liberated. So she has to learn this lesson, and she has to prepare for it. Otherwise, she will set more causes in motion which will produce bondage again. She has to learn. And uh, she should have learned much earlier. And her mother and herself would both have been happier had she learned earlier, but she did not. But under duty and under the pressure of her own sense of values, she lost her own life, actually. Nature considers all these intricate situations and out of them will come good and bad. Her devotion and her integrity are causes that will produce great good effects. Her lack of understanding and wisdom in permitting a major purpose of life to be thwarted will also probably produce lessons that she will have to face. She will have to learn the importance of not becoming completely overwhelmed by anyone else. These lessons nature will bring to her in the due course of time. But in the meantime, these crises arise and they have to be faced with some form of understanding. In her case, she had enough understanding to begin to gradually come out of it. She had some concepts of philosophy and principles. And on these rather slender resources, she is beginning to build. But without these resources, she could never have built. Had she been a materialist, she would have been completely lost. Psychologically, therefore, there is this tremendous need for the resources inside upon which to, to build the future. And all these resources center on law. Our only hope is in law, the value and fact of things. We have to believe that what we earn we will get. If we do not have this belief, we have nothing left to work for for or nothing left to work with. If we are in a world of accidents, then nothing is meaningful, and only blind chance can guide us through the maze of circumstances. But if we are in a world which is a lawful universe, then this law applies to us. It applies right into our own psychic integration. And here it works continuously. And the belief in it also works. And once this belief has been set within our subconscious, it continues to play its part in drawing us into a pattern of reasonable conduct. If you want, therefore, to experience uh, some type of integration, uh, it is always best to hunt for the law in the thing that happens. Instead of reacting, seek, search. Do the same thing with every problem that you might if you were a criminal investigator looking for motives, seeking to solve the mystery of a crime in the best Earl Stanley Gardner manner. Everything that happens is a little plot of some kind. It is a challenge. Our own lives are the greatest mystery stories ever written. And in each one of them there are chains of clues which if we rightly read them if we use the wonderful inductive method described in the writings of Sherlock Holmes, we will find that there is a law, a plan, a reason, and a pattern behind every single thing that can happen. Even the most confused thing is actually completely orderly, because the confusion is the effect of confusion, and that is order. If confusion led to order, there'd be no order in the universe. But things must be like their own causes. So confusion bears witness to confusion, and this is law. To find this law in the thoughtless child, to find this law in the wayward family, not easy. But if we do not find this law for our own protection and our own guidance and our own God, guardianship, we cannot face these dilemmas. Oh, yes, we'll survive them somehow, but we'll survive them with alcohol, or we'll survive them with ulcers, or with mental breakdowns, or with broken homes. And these survivals are not by any means the best. To survive them with dignity, 
that is truly uh, proper to a human creature, we must inwardly work from a pattern of principles. These laws have to be sought out and found. And one, of course, of the most simple explains and explanations of all law is that two wrongs will never make a right. Therefore, any reaction that is wrong to an action that is wrong makes two wrongs. This is hard because we feel that a wrong action justifies another of a similar kind. Yet, as we learn from the Beatitudes, this is not the way Jesus taught it. He taught us not to return evil for evil, but to return good for evil. We can't always do it. How many persons really, honestly, can return good for evil with a full heart? Very few. They may make a kind of a mental exercise out of it. They do it in a sense of duty sometimes, from a sense of self-centeredness in others. They think there's a great dignity in suffering thus virtuously. But from a real honest motive, because in our hearts we are really sorry for the person who does evil, because we know what they are doing to themselves, and therefore our first thought is to save them or help them, not to be angry with them. Can we do it? Yet if we cannot do it, we cannot keep the law. If we return evil for evil, we simply now set in motion another chain of circumstances that will bring a new evil to us. Because this new cause is an evil plant, a weed, a poisonous or noxious plant, which we have sowed in the earth of our own psyche. Someday that one will grow and poison us again. We cannot escape the result. We cannot in any way block off the effect. So if we are in this emergency, then we cannot afford to permit this second evil to come. Someone has hurt our affections. We break up a home. Our first thought is to strip the other person of everything we can because uh, we hate them. We do everything possible to try to make certain that they'll never be happy again. And what is the end? Thousands of people wandering around with this money they've taken from someone else. And these people that have the money and have, have justified and fully enjoyed their grudges are the most miserable lot of human beings you'll ever want to beat. I've had to work with a great many of them. Their vengeance brought nothing but misery. For a little sense of offended pride they compounded a felony. And wherever we do it, nature steps in and says, you are going to learn that that is not the answer. And there is nothing we can do about it. The individual who cheats, who deceives, who shirks his responsibilities, is setting in motion causes that he will have to live with. Just as surely as the parent who has no time for the child develops a child that has no time for the parent. These things are inevitable. And we cannot afford to be unmindful. Every day something happens where we must think of all of this. But we don't have to sit down and rationalize and philosophize for two hours over everything that comes along. The point is for us to gradually, instinctively get into our consciousness that the law of cause and effect operates, and that whenever the emergency arises, we must act in the long-range concept of that law, so that at the end of any situation that arises affecting us, we can say honestly, I have done no cruel, unkind, or unreasonable thing. I have perpetuated no evil. If we can say that, we have a very good chance of our own personal lives taking on new and important meaning. One problem we have all the time is fixations of this nature. People have a grievance. 
that something has gone wrong. And from that time on, they will never forget that incident. And that area of life is blocked for them for the rest of their days, simply because they can never get over the area in which the injury occurred. This just simply impoverishes a life. It's a wonderful thing to forget anything that causes us uh, to take too firm an attitude against any normal and reasonable procedure. The individual who hasn't had a poor marriage swears never to marry again. Now, perhaps the, the difficulty was entirely their own fault, but perhaps they've learned something. Perhaps they may find someone else who's learned something. You cannot say that the fact that a marriage is, has been bad that these two people should settle down for the rest of their lives, resolving never again to have faith in any member of the opposite sex. This is a, just an attitude that thousands of people stew in. But they're cutting themselves off from necessary experience, because nature says it's better to have a bad time than no time. It's better to have difficulty than do nothing. Because difficulty always gives you an opportunity to solve something. Difficulty is an opportunity to grow. To do nothing is to be neither hot nor cold, and the good book said, The Lord speweth these out of his mouth. <laughs> oh, there are some very trite statements in the good book. And we don't want to be in that condition. So we have to do something. And if we cut off our attitudes or our areas of interest with some dramatic mental block, we're again setting a cause in motion that is going to produce an effect we will not want to live with. So psychologically, we are all trying to build a future that is better than the past. Or if there were good things in the past that we lost from one reason or another, we hope to reclaim them sometime, or something similar or even better. To do this, we've got to think in terms of law operating, that if we cause these things, we will get them, and that we cause them by opening ourselves generously to experience and at the same time developing the character which will permit us to handle experience and handle it constructively. As the negative factors of bad handling evaporate or disappear, health will be better, life will be more successful, and the future will be more rich in fulfillments rather than in frustrations. Wherever we fail, uh, we suffer to some degree. And we must fail if our causes are wrong. Therefore, we are bound to be ultimately disillusioned in that which is not true. In the main point, then, in our, our remembrance, of, remembrance of the law, is that the formulas of, psycho, of psychological therapy are not like bottled medicines. Uh, we do not solve the mental sicknesses of people with formulas. We do not say that we can give them some kind of a psychological pill that will enable them to violate the law of cause and effect. The physician and the patient must work with the law. The patient must be taught to know that the physician perhaps can assist him in an emergency, but nobody but the individual himself can conquer his own temperament. That if he does not make these adjustments, if he does not begin to set better causations in motion, no scientific skill in the world can keep him healthy or happy. He gets out of one complex and falls into another. He must correct the cause. And what we all want to do every day, as much as we can, is set up the causation of a beautiful, constructive, valuable life. And we do this only to the degree that we are able to practice beautiful, constructive, and valuable policies and keep constructive attitudes perpetually operating in our conduct. If we do this, we have a right to believe that the law will protect us. 
and thousands of years of history and hundreds of millions of human experiences have proven that this is true. That if we follow and obey the rules of nature in mental and emotional conduct, as in physical, we shall enjoy the peace and the tranquility and the poise and the friendliness which obedience brings. For in keeping the rules, we make ourselves the best kind of people that it is possible for us to be. Well, time's up, folks, and thank you very much. Oh, I have an announcement I have to make.